some of our bruised toes, uh, we began looking at discipleship in the family. And we did so by focusing on men's call to headship. We looked at God's word and we looked into how this is God's created order and his purpose as he has commanded men to step into headship, both in the family and in the church. But we also saw that this did not come about without some sort of hitch. We went into Genesis 3 and looked at the fall of mankind. Now you couple that with a society that just seems to hate men, we started to see that men are beginning to uh, react in destructive ways. We see men acting out in either aggression towards their wife and children, or they respond emotionally distant and removed. We made it abundantly clear that this is not headship, to respond either aggressively or distant. Rather, true manhood and true headship is rooted in servanthood. From there, men, you were then charged to biblically lead your family, not dominating them, not passing off responsibility, but by dying to yourself and, and serving your family. With that covered, we were then able to address the beautiful call that is placed on the life of women as they are to build up their husbands in this headship. Now today, I want us to look at the family unit and parents together as it pertains to discipling their children. So even if you're a single parent, this is still going to be very prevalent, or prevalent to you, or if you're planning on having kids... It was either that or talk about your birthday. Which one do you want? So regardless, this is going to be very prevalent. This is going to be able, you're going to be able to apply this to your life. But the purpose is, is I want to get very practical today. I want us to be able to look at real life examples that you can then take home and use in discipling your kids or your grandkids. The reason for this is because so many parents feel that they have failed. When it comes to discipling their children, they feel that they have failed. And that is something that absolutely breaks my heart because you can do this. You absolutely can disciple your children in a very big way. And so today I want to build you up and encourage you of this remarkable call that's been placed on your life as a parent. And I hope that as we go through some of these ideas that this will spark something in your life that will allow you to then take discipleship into your homes. So to begin, as you know, I have to teach you. You can't come here and me not teach you. In fact, I, I don't think I could sleep at night if I preached a sermon that you didn't learn from the Bible. So even though we're going to try and, and focus on implementing the back half of the sermon, how to implement discipleship, the truth is, no matter what we try and implement, no matter what we try and do, if your relationship with Christ is not authentic, you will run into a do as I say, not as I do kind of relationship with your kids. And as a student minister for 10 years, if you want to mess with a child, create bitterness, anger, and rebellion, tell them this should be important in their life when there's no sign that it's important in yours. Your faith, your relationship with Christ has to be your own. It should be genuine and authentic. Now this doesn't mean that you can't have questions or doubts. In fact, you have an opportunity to ask these questions. And there's gonna be another one next week. So if you have another question, you're not limited on how many questions you can ask. If this series takes us to the end of the year, I'm perfectly fine with that. I want you to ask the questions that you are wrestling with, that you have doubted with, that others have brought speculation and has challenged your faith. Ask those questions. This is your time. There's no name on it. You can ask it anonymously and we can address it. But it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to have no questions, no doubts, but they have to be brought to us so that we can disciple you and minister to you. And so this is where we begin today. I want us to look at the Shema. Now, I may be saying that wrong because I don't speak biblical Hebrew, but this is the prayer that Jews pray on a daily basis. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so I want us to look at this passage and allow it to be the guiding light as we look at discipleship in the family. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, it says, 
Hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons, and speak, uh, speak of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. You shall also tie them as signs in your hand, or tie, as a sign, let me go back and try and read again. You shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It starts out with, Hear, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God is one. Now this verse is foundational and essential to our faith, but this verse played an even greater importance to Israel as they were surrounded by pagan nations, many of which were polytheistic. You see, they lived around people groups who worshipped thousands of gods. And these poor people, when, what you come to find is when you create a god, a man-made god, he, that god will possess very significant man-made qualities. And so what happens is you have these poor people who have these gods, and they don't know if the god's upset with them or not. They don't know, you know, is this God going to accept my prayer and sacrifice? Did I do the right sacrifice for the right God for my prayer? Is it going to be answered? Israel needed to know who they served, and their kids needed to know who they worshipped. They needed to know that their God was not only God, but that he was the one true God. The only God. So that this, these gods that they see that people are serving, that they're cutting and mutilating their bodies to appease, these gods that accept human and child sacrifices, all of Israel needed to know that that was not God. The one true God is one, and there is no other God. This is the same for us. We need to know who it is that we serve, or likely... We will then fall into worshiping a false God, a false Christ. Because there's a lot of false gods out there, false Christs out there, and to make matters worse, guess what they happen to name him? Jesus. It can be confusing. We have those who profess to know Jesus, and yet they seem to think he's fine with living in unrepentant sin. Because it's, it's kind of weird because it's amazing that their God seems to change his mind at the same time culture changes. Well, that's a man-made God. Because scripture tells us something different. James 1.17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is, above, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that, that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and he will not do it, or has he spoken, and he will not fulfill it. It's incredible that God will somehow change his mind in regard to our sin just so we can be happy. That God would suspend his holiness, that God would suspend his justice, that God would change his own words just so that we, he could accommodate our wallowing in our sin. You see, that's not God. Because if we have no idea who Jesus is, how on earth can we begin to teach our children who he is? Now, you were promised to be encouraged, so let's go. The first thing that must happen, parents, in our lives is that we must be in full submission to the one true God. Not a God of our making, not a God that condones our sin, but the God of the Bible. We must first be in full submission to him. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now let's take a moment and let's look at these. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. Why? Well, Jeremiah 17, 9 explains why. It says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? We need to love the Lord our God with all of our heart because our heart has no loyalty to us. Our heart seeks to sin 
And that is it. And our culture says, follow your heart. No. Your heart is more than willing to deceive you. It has no loyalty. My heart is deceiving and will turn to sin every opportunity it gets because I am broken. So why would I follow my heart? And yet, God says that we are to love him with this deceitful, depraved heart of ours. Well, how on earth does that work out? How does that look? Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Verse 11. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Do you see it? We cannot begin to love God with all of our heart apart from his word. Apart from being in his word. You see, you've got to make God's word a priority. Real simple. You can download an audio Bible. You can listen to it on the way to work. You can listen to it while you're doing house chores. Read your Bible with your spouse. Get in God's word. If you want a list of preachers that I trust wholeheartedly, I'll give you some names because that... Look, they're better than me. Listen to them. That's fine. I don't care. On your own time, listen to them. When you're here, listen to me. I can give you a list of preachers that I love to listen to for edification, for growth, for knowledge. I would be more than happy to pass that on to you. We've got to be active in God's word. We have to grow in the knowledge of God's word. And when we do so, God's word will overwhelm our heart and take over, and our children are going to see this. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our soul. In Hebrew, this word means the life of a being. So it's from the inside out. If, if we put something in, it's going to come out. And so to understand, we cannot live a double life. What God does within our soul is going to be expressed in our life. And so this word soul, I believe, encompasses that. Proverbs 18, 20 through 22 says, With the fruit of a person's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Hashtag Heather. Now, why do I address the tongue? Because Jesus in Matthew 12 says, For the mouth speaks from that which is in the heart. Here again we see the heart, the inner being, being in tandem with one another, and it flows out. And so you start to see why God's commands are not a la carte. We can't say, oh, I'll love God with all of my, all of my heart, but I'm not going to love God with all of my soul. You can't. They are intertwined, and it's going to manifest as such. It's all connected. And so there's, unless there's a true conversion, a true surrender, a true love, there cannot be an outpouring of that. But the other way goes as well. If there's not a true conversion, regardless, your family is going to taste of the fruit which is in your heart and in your soul. So this begs the question, is it Christ through the Holy Spirit as revealed through his word who is changing you? Lastly, we are to love the Lord with all of our strength. Now this is my favorite part because yet again we see it building. We see it connecting. To love God with all of our strength, or in some translations it says might, is to love God with all that we are. If we look through the Hebrew and we see where else this word is used, it's used in such a way like this. It's, uh, it'll be used in a way of very, abundance, so much, exceedingly. So when we begin to see it, yet God has commanded us to love him in such a way that it must be authentic. The kind of love that cannot be faked. Now, you might be able to fake it to us, you might be able to fake it to your friends, but you cannot fake it to your wife, your, your husband, or your children, because they are going to see you day in and day out. And if that's you, this reality of knowing that you're not going to be able to hide it terrifies you, 
then let's talk. Because that's something I've been wrestling with. There's areas in my life that I'm struggling. There's areas in my life that I'm lacking. I, I lack patience. I was talking with my, my mom on the way home from the airport last night. I was like, look, I only have so much empathy to give. And if Evelyn's crying over nothing, when something happens, I found myself not having the empathy that I know in my heart needs to be extended. If you're crying so much over my taking the phone, when you fall, I'm noticing my heart's not reaching out the way it should. Now that's concerning to me. I'm not proud of it. I'm telling you, this is where I'm struggling. And that's where I'm terrified because I want her to know that dad's going to be there. And so you see what's in her is going to flow outward. And if you find yourself and there's traits that you're saying, that concerns me, then meet with me at invitation and allow us to pray together. You can certainly pray for me as well. But let's get together and talk about that. Our faith has got to be authentic. Now this brings me to my second point. Discipling your kids will be done by their watching you. They will take in more of what you do and say at home than what you do or say here. It messes with kids when it's a do as I say, not as I do kind of relationship. They will see through that veil and see that your faith is fake. Now I loved student ministry and I loved ministering to kids, but what was so frustrating is, is you have these kids who come and they're building up, they're, they're being teachable and they're growing in their faith, and then they go home. They come to church, they're eager to learn, they've believed, they've repented, they've been baptized, they're hungry for God's word, and then they go home. They go home to a home that could care less. Homes that they're told by mom and dad, we're Christian. And yet their home does not nurture their faith. It does not feed their desire to fill their hearts with the word of God. It is so discouraging when families will not partner with the church and discipleship. Paul's writing to Timothy, who is an elder at the church of Ephesus, and he says this in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, Knowing from, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're like me, you're reading this, and you're kind of looking at it going, well, what was he falling back upon? What was he to continue in? What is, what is Paul calling Timothy to continue in? And it's the word of God in which he was taught by childhood. Well, why? Well, he goes right on and says it in verse 16, and this is verse 16 and 17, and this is exactly what our church believes, hook, line, and sinker, uncompromisingly. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Now, maybe you're reading this like I am, and you're going, okay, Paul, that's great, but what was Timothy taught? How can I use this? Tell me what you taught Timothy. Tell me what his parents, tell me what his mother. Give me some information here so that I can do it. How can I raise a son who's like Timothy or a daughter who's like Priscilla? Give me specifics, Paul. Don't just give me vague generalities. I want to know exactly because I want to implement it. But before we could ever do this, we have to be in complete surrender in ourselves. We cannot instruct our children in the way of salvation apart from his word. His word tells us what we need to know. If we're going to disciple our kids, we need to be in his word and discipling them in his word. But here's the question. How can we implement such a thing in our family? First, we need to set clear goals. We need to be realistic. We need to be practical. We need to understand that you're not a failure because you had a bad week. That you have not failed because you sent a kid or kids to bed early. You have not failed because of that. And the reason why I'm saying that is because at, what we're going to go through today is this. We want you to inject Christ, his word, scripture, in everyday interaction so that 
everything does not hinge on your time of Bible study. Does that make sense? So that when you have a bad night and the kids are not focused or they're rambunctious or they're just not giving into it, they're not having it, and they go to bed early, your day is not hinging on that because you have injected Christ throughout the day. But so many times what we do is we put everything, we're going to go through the day and tonight we're going to do this. And what happens when it doesn't happen? We feel like failures, we've let it go, and we're discouraged. So I want us to implement Christ in everyday life throughout the day so it does not hinge on either your morning or nightly Bible studies. So let's look practically. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7 says, These words which I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. What do we see in this passage? We're seeing that from our relationship with God, we are diligently repetitive in our speaking of God, his character, and his word. This doesn't mean that you have to be a Bible scholar. And so let's get some ideas. Are there any actors in the crowd? Anybody who's in drama? Maybe not. I think you'll still get into this, because I wasn't either, but I think this is really cool. Use it as an opportunity to bring the Bible to life. For example, if we look at the story of David and Goliath, something you can do is, I don't know about you, we've moved, we have a bunch of boxes. If you need them, we can give them to you. Have kind of, an, have kind of a craft time where you tell the kids, we're going to decorate this, these boxes to look like armor for Dad. They're going to work on it, they're going to draw on it, and then they're, you're going to put it on, Dad. And what's going to happen is, is you can read through the story of David and Goliath. And when it gets to the point of Goliath, this is dad's time to shine. This is what you've been training for your whole life. Put on the boxes and pretend to be Goliath. Bring the Bible to life. Give the kids bean bags or light objects. Nothing heavy, because nothing will stop a Bible study more than dad getting hit. Allow the kids to and, 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 and allow the kids to enact, reenact. Throw the beanbags. Throw. Have them conquer Goliath. And if one and if you have multiple kids, it's okay. Rewind. Dad, get up. Then the next kid take Dad down. Rewind. Get up. Then have the next kid take. But let them engage in the story and let them talk about it. Now let's say, let's say that's as far as you get. After they after they slay Goliath, they want to play and roll around with Dad. You've still brought the Bible to life. But let's, let's say you can go a little further. You can now talk about the Bible to them. Talk about how the Israelites were so afraid. Talk, talk about how Jesus came in and saved us from sin as David intervened on Israel's behalf. It's an opportunity to bring biblical truth in a way that's going to be fun and engaging, and it's going to change the way they read this story from that point forward. They will be 50 years old and remember pelting dad with bean bags, but they will remember this story. Maybe you're more of a game person. Now, I'm not, but maybe you like to tie games into the Bible. That's no problem. There's a lot of great resources. There's a resource called Simply Youth Ministry that you can use, or just type into Google, Youth Ministry Bible Games. Use the resources that student ministers and children's ministers use. They're readily available. And one of the games I saw, which I found pretty interesting, was called What's in the Box? Shout out to Brad Pitt. But you take a box, or maybe several boxes, and you put objects in them that you can then hype up as being horribly gross. Show them pictures of rotten vegetables, a rodent, whatever, but hype it up so that you build up the anxiety, so that they're anxious to put their hand in. You're trying to invoke an emotion. You can use things like spaghetti. You can use things like jello, toy spiders, but you want to build up this anxiety in them and you want them to feel this, this fear before they reach in so that you can implement this. Why were you afraid? Now, maybe they'll say because dad said we were going to touch a dead rat. Legitimate argument. Makes sense. But this gives you the opportunity to tell them how people will try and invoke fear to change them and to dictate their life. 
And you can go to 1 Peter 5.7. It says, cast all your anxieties on him who cares for you. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, by thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will, get, will, guard, your heart in, uh, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So now you've connected a biblical truth with an experience, and that is a combination for remembering. Well, what about prayer? Our families need to pray together. Now, what we need to understand is that when kids go to bed and they want to pray, they may very well get distracted. Have you noticed kids get distracted easily at all? They may get distracted. And so praying with your kids needs to be intentional and laser-focused. But understand why when I say that, I don't mean heavily structured. Your kids do not need to be laser-focused. Get them to talk to God like they would talk to a friend. Now, as you hear their prayers, you're going to have opportunities to engage their lives. If they pray for a friend who's sick at school, that's an invitation to be brought into their life, and now you can engage them on a personal level. Next day after school, you can ask them, how is so-and-so? Are they feeling better? When you're walking, you can pray for that person. They're inviting you into their lives. Now, as a special note, I want to say this. As adults, we can get pretty wordy. I know. I do it every Sunday. So use your kids as an example. If your kids are praying for 30 seconds, don't pray for five minutes. Keep it short with them. But also, this is another opportunity as you pray to model biblical principles in their life. For example, say you had a rough day and you yelled at your daughter. If you had not repented yet, which I hope you have, because either way, it's a model, go to the Lord and repent before him about yelling and being angry and, 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 and sinning against your daughter, but also sinning against him. It models repentance to your kids, and then say you haven't apologized, immediately after address it with your daughter or your son. But model that in your prayer. And do it within that time frame because it shows them not only that sin is a sin against someone else, it affects other people, but that our sin is against God. Allow that time to be a time in which we can model. Another way we can engage their lives with Scripture is by interjecting Bible stories in everyday life. Anybody ever gone to McDonald's with kids? I haven't yet. I just do it myself. I'm just practicing. So if you're going through the drive-thru and you order your food, after you order, ask your kids a simple question. What do you think Jesus would order? You're going to hear some pretty cool examples, some pretty funny ones. So be it. It'll be a good good dialogue. And you you could say something silly like, I think he'd order two fish fillets. Well, why? Remember when Jesus fed 5,000 with five pieces of bread and two fish? Imagine what he could do with fish fillets. But you've just now injected an experience with Bible, and who knows, from that day forward, when they think fish fillets, they're thinking of Jesus' miracle. Good. Now, I wouldn't have eaten if Jesus used McDonald's fish fillets, but that's not the point. What you're doing with this is Deuteronomy 6. Speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road. If they don't know the story, you can read it that night. You're injecting real life into a Bible story. Now this week, um, I spoke to uh, one of Heather's friends, a remarkable woman who, who takes discipling her kids very seriously. And she has a, a bunch of great ideas. So I called her up and um, wanted to thank her, one, for praying for me because um, when Heather was looking for a husband, uh, they prayed for that husband and then there I was. So I wanted to thank her for that. But then Uh, We talked about discipleship, and she gave some really, really good ideas. The first one was a worship song of the week. They select a worship song, and they play it every morning while the kids are getting ready for school. She said, this has been really encouraging because I found later in the week, as the kids are cleaning their room, I'm hearing them sing the song on their own. And if I can be honest with you, this last week I was very much tempted. I was on the computer and I was working and I was tempted. But God kept bringing a worship song to my mind. 
And I, it just kept running through my head every time temptation came. And it's amazing how that became an instrument to fight, not to just cower again and try and weather the storm. It became an opportunity to step out into the storm and, and, and sing out God's praises to combat it. Worship is powerful. And implementing it in their daily life is going to be powerful as well. She also mentioned that her kids have journals they have prayer journals. She said they're not old enough to write, so when we emphasize that mornings are for Jesus, she says, I have them get their Bibles and journals, and they spend time drawing a picture for Jesus. And, and she said, when we're in church, I tell them, draw a picture of something that the preacher talked about. When, when the preacher's preaching, and draw a picture of something that you experienced. And so they're engaging in listening to the sermons and, and engaging by writing it out. Now, all of this is done in, in tandem with building relationships with them. As you're driving to school, you can listen to a podcast and you begin to, to leverage that 20 minutes to, to school or, or, or whatnot. And you ask intentional questions for intentional conversations. Even if you ask a, a question that's not yes or no, don't they find a way to make it a one-word answer? especially teenagers, you're going to have to draw it out. Ask more questions. Help them understand, we're not done talking till you answer. How was your day? Fine. What happened? Nothing. Draw it out. Ask intentional questions. She, what I also love, which we'll talk about not only with music, but also with movies, is this. She says, say you listen to secular music. Engage that by asking them, you know, that song had a really good beat to it, but what, but what they sang, was it true? So you're not sheltering your kids from the secular culture. I think what Christians do that is actually more catastrophic is we try and keep our kids completely from being exposed to the secular culture. And then when they are, it overwhelms them. They need to be able to engage the secular culture so that when you have songs or, or, or movies that attack the Christian faith, they can stand there and go, but here's why it's not true. We can't shelter them from it or it will bombard them and overtake them. And so she even goes on and says, look, if you listen to a secular song, obviously don't listen. Do I really have to give examples? Engage it. Why is this not true according to God's word? She goes on, and, and this is another thing we need to emphasize, is meals with one another. But not just meals with one another. Meals without electronics and she says we have meals we have dinner together with no electronics and we ask three questions what were the highs of the day these are what were things that made the day special what made it awesome what were the lows things that made the day bad or things that made you feel sad and then it's thankful fors what are the things that happened today that made you thankful the emphasis is because we want to engage our kids in seeing where God is alive and active. I talked about movies. Well, say you have a movie night. This is something they taught us in preaching class, which I know you, know, you guys weren't there, so you know, it is what it is. But our preacher kept saying, think homiletically. Big fancy word. That's Think of everything as if it's a Bible illustration. Not everything's going to be. But if you do that, for example, she says, if you're watching Frozen, you can, you can insert gospel elements into it. What did you think of Anna sacrificing herself for Elsa? That gives you the opportunity to talk about Jesus' sacrifice, doesn't it? If we're thinking in that way, we can, we can see secular culture, but then inject Jesus into it so that they're not being sheltered, but they're still experiencing Christ. Why is this movie not true? How does it line up? How does it not line up with what we believe? Did the hero act in a godly way? Why or why not? Engage the culture. Don't shelter them from it, but engage it. Discipleship in the family, by reading the word of God, by praying and worshiping together, is essential. And this is only going to be enhanced through your relationship with them. You will see your children follow you as you grow. You will see your children begin to see Jesus and his word in the world around them. 
capitalize on this. Parents, spend solo time with your kids. Each of you, one-on-one with one of your children. And use this opportunity to build them up in Christ. So they're young. You know, they need to know that if we serve a living God, then he's going to be alive and active right here, right now in their life. And it's our job as parents that we can engage that and say, listen, here's what I'm seeing God do in your life right now. Take them out to get ice cream, just just you. And, And address this in their life. Evelyn's only 10 months old. She doesn't understand a word I'm saying. But say she's five. Say she's three. I can engage her and say, I love that God has created in your heart joy. This joy is going to bring, bring, this joy is going to affect other people around you. And it affects me. I'm a pessimist. I hate waking up. When I wake up, I am grumpy. But you know my favorite thing in the world? is creeping into her room and seeing that first morning smile. Or when Heather's already woken her up, I come creeping around the corner seeing her eating, and the first thing I see in the morning is her smile. That affects you. And I can tell her, Evelyn, God is creating in your life joy that is going to affect other people. I pray that God continues to grow this because this joy is from Christ, and he is cultivating in you joy. Build up these traits that you identify that are from God and begin to encourage them in that growth and show them that God is active still in their life. Discipleship is intentional. You don't have to be a scholar, but there's something that needs to be clear. Heather and I discipled so many kids in our time, and we're not scholars, we're not gurus of ministry. We simply love Jesus and we're intentional about loving kids and pointing them to Jesus. It's truly that simple. But understand something. We did that in ministry. The church at best has 40 hours a year with your children. 40 hours a year. If you look up on the screen, each mark represents an hour. The church has 40 hours a year to engage your children in their Christian faith, but you as parents have 3,000 hours a year. That's an incredible opportunity. But that's also why I don't want you to feel discouraged. Because in those hours, you find an hour that it just didn't work. That's okay. There's hours surrounding it that you're injecting Christ in your everyday lives. But understand You as parents have a beautiful call and an incredible opportunity to influence your children for the gospel. And if you would partner with the church, we now have 3,040 hours to, to invest into your kids and teaching them about Christ. But parents, we must first submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. From there, we will begin to look for ways that our kids may see him and experience him and love him, that their faith would become their own, and that our faith would enhance theirs as well. Let's pray. Father God, I've been a parent only 10 months, and I've still been feeling this this sense of weight on my shoulders. And I know that there's other parents who know this experience, who who know exactly what it feels like and the pressure and the weight that it feels like to disciple their family. God, I ask that you edify and equip and encourage the men in here knowing that that you did not create them to be heads of the household, that you did not call them to be who they are and not equip them to do so. But God, I pray that as we went through these specific examples as to how we can disciple our kids, Lord, I pray that through your Holy Spirit that we would have our juices flowing to look for new and exciting ways to engage the world, to to be able to show you in everyday life, to be able to teach our kids biblical truth. Lord, if there is a parent here right now who says, I want to do that, but I know that my relationship is not there. 
during this time of invitation, we ask that they would go to the back and allow us to minister to them, to pray for them. Lord, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity to minister to our kids, that we have 3,000 hours a year in which we can pour into them. Help us, Lord, to utilize these hours the best we can to love them and cultivate a heart that is for your son, that they would know that not only are they loved by you, but they were certainly, that they can certainly be saved by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.